This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. The second section in economics uh, looks at microeconomics, and this considers uh, the price of goods and the quantity which is demanded, uh, how the price of goods might affect the quantity produced, uh, and how a market price or equilibrium price is arrived at. And the first thing we've drawn here is what's called a demand curve, uh, which depicts how the quantity demanded Q uh, depends on the price which you're charging. Uh, and normally you would expect this to be a downward sloping demand curve, uh, which means uh, essentially that as you uh, increase the price, uh, the quantity demanded is going to fall off. So quite a low price down here we're having quite a high uh, demand, uh, but if you were to increase the price there, the demand is going to go there. So an increase in price is causing a fall in demand. This is the way most goods are going to uh, expect it to move. You move up and down the demand curve uh, primarily uh, by changing the price. The shape of the slope of the demand curve uh, depends on these factors. Uh, first of all, consumers' income. If consumers are very poor and you put the price up just a little bit, uh, then they're likely to react to that quite strongly. They don't have any spare cash. Uh, if consumers have a lot of income, then this product might be uh, essentially insignificant, a trivial part of their expenditure. You might be able to double the price of the goods and they barely notice. They, they, they really don't change the quantity demanded at all. Substitutes and complements, we'll see more in the next slide, but basically a substitute is where you can switch from one sort of goods to another. Complements are where you tend to buy goods together. And we'll see the effects in the next one. Fashion and taste. You advertise a good, it becomes very fashionable then for a given price, more are going to be demanded. Uh, maybe six months later, the goods uh, become unfashionable, uh, and for the given price, demand has fallen away, uh, and so you can hardly sell them at any price. Whether the goods are essential or luxury, essential goods, basic foodstuffs, for example, uh, whether the price goes up or down, uh, people have to tend to buy the same sort of quantity. This is what's so this fairly price insensitive we'll see it's called price inelastic whereas luxuries if the price of a luxury goes up luxuries are things you don't need to buy if the price of the luxury goes up then uh, many people are likely to say well i'll do without that this this year and uh, and so on uh, i'm not gonna, i'm not going to be uh, willing to pay that price to so be fairly sensitive to price changes and finally the expectation of uh, future price changes if you expect prices to go up in the future, you could go out now and lay in a stock of these goods. You could hoard them, could increase current quantities demanded. Whereas if you think the price is going to go down, you will not consume now, you postpone consumption until you really need the goods and you can buy them at the minimum possible price. Now, supplements, uh, a big one, uh, substitutes and uh, uh, complements here. A substitute is where you can switch consumption from one good to uh, another. Let's take uh, so, uh, butter and low-fat spreads. So these are both things you can kind of put on your sandwiches. So I am the butter producer. Uh, somebody else is the uh, low-fat spread producer, the vegetable spread producer. I keep my prices the same. Uh, yet if uh, the producers of the low-fat spread, the vegetable spread, reduces their price, uh, then people are going to move their purchases from butter to the cheaper substitute, the cheaper alternative. Uh, if the uh, vegetable spread, the person put their prices up, then by doing nothing at all, people will, uh, will come to me. They will abandon the high, higher-priced substitute and goods will come to me. And this is altering uh, really what the supply curve will look like uh, because uh, essentially for the same price, because of the way the substitute price moves, my demand will be going up and down. 
Uh, so it's essentially not moving up and down the supply curve, but it's shifting it around the place. Complementary effects, uh, let's take for this uh, cars and petrol. Let's say the government uh, uh, abandoned sales tax on cars. Uh, so effectively the price of cars goes down and demand for cars will go up. Uh, and of course, if demand for cars will go up, demand for petrol will go up, even if the price hasn't changed. So an increase in demand for one good will cause an increase in demand for another. Price elasticity of demand uh, uh, is, is uh, what allows us to define or calculate how uh, prices and demand for the goods kind of move together. So let's start with the graph uh, here. Uh, if you say something is uh, uh, as an inelastic price elasticity of demand, it is certainly price insensitive. Uh, if you say something is inelastic, it's fairly kind of rigid. So you move the price a lot uh, and the demand doesn't change very much. So in this one here, I maybe uh, uh, increase my price from here to here and my demand falls from there to there. But if I take the elastic demand, the, the elastic unit, uh, elastic means it's quite a bit of flexibility, if, if you like, uh, there. Uh, and I start with my price here, uh, and I kind of, again, increase it by kind of about the same amount, then I'm going to have quite a large fall off there in the demand. It's very price sensitive. Small change in price is going to provoke a large change in demand. This can be calculated. Uh, it is calculated as the relative change in demand divided by the relative change in price, or the proportional change in demand divided by the proportional change in price, or percentage change in demand divided by the percentage change in price. Now, you may have realized that if I were to put the price up, the proportional change there is going to be positive. Uh, this will uh, cause the demand to fall. So this is going to go down, so it's going to be negative. So strictly speaking, the price elasticity of demand is negative, but by convention, the negative term is ignored. So let's uh, look at the, uh, the, the kind of three main areas or values, if you like, that the price elasticity of demand can take. Uh, first of all, if uh, the price elasticity of demand is greater than one, and this means numerically greater than one, okay, so what it might mean, for example, is you change your price by 10% and your uh, volume changes by 20%. So it's price sensitive. 10% change in price provokes a 20% change in volume. If I raise my prices 10%, the volume will fall 20%. This is elastic. I think you can see also that by raising prices here, I'm going to reduce volume. I'm going to reduce revenue, okay? Uh, so if my prices go up 10%, my volume decreases 20%, I will be losing revenue. If we added exactly one here, so uh, if this was to change 5%, and this was to change 5%, uh, a 5% increase in price, uh, that means a 5% decrease in volume, my revenue will stay the same. And if it was to go the other way, down to relatively inelastic, uh, I could maybe put my, uh, my prices up here by 20%, and my volume would only uh, change by 10%, so my volume is fairly resistant here, and it's not really greatly affected by a change in price. Uh, do you see here that by putting up my prices, I'm going to increase revenue? Because my prices go up 20%, my revenue only falls 10%, and I'm therefore going to have an increase in revenue. The calculations of price elasticity of demand, there are two ways of doing it. You can do arc price elasticity of demand, or we'll see in the next slide, point price elasticity of demand. So here we have uh, demand, uh, maybe starting at four and a thousand. Uh, we put the price up, five demand falls to 900. 
So the proportional change of demand here, the actual change in demand, is 100. Uh, let's say 1,000 down to 900. Uh, and what we do is you take the midpoint of the, the two ends, the 900 and the 1,000, as the for the proportions, so 950. Similarly, uh, when you look into proportional change in price, the price is changed by 1 uh, from, from 4 to 5. Uh, but we take the midpoint, 4.5. So the proportional change in price is 22.5. Price elasticity of demand, to say, change of price about 20%. Demand changes about 10%. We have an inelastic effect. The uh, demand is relatively resilient. Uh, and we can predict from that that we should be able to see an increase in revenue by increasing prices. So if we started here, our revenue would be 4,000, and moving to here, our revenue is 4,500. Nice big increase in price, not a great big increase, not a great big change in the volume. We're winning, if you like, the revenue stakes by increasing the um, price. The point elasticity of demand, uh, uh, instead of taking midway between, takes one end. Okay, so let's do it at $4. What is the price elasticity of demand at a price of 4? Well, the proportional increase in demand, uh, the actual increase is going to be, let's say, or uh, decrease, doesn't matter which way you go. Let's say it's 1,000 down to 900, so that's your 100. Uh, but now we're saying we're going to do it at 4 or 1,000. Uh, so the proportional... Uh, it would be decrease if we're moving this way, proportional decrease in demand is 10%. Uh, and what has caused that? It is an increase in price by one from four. So it's a 25% increase in price. Uh, so here we have the price elasticity of demand of four. And you see there's not a, a huge difference uh, between the two, the two methods uh, here. This was 4.7, it was still inelastic, this is four. It's just, just two different approaches to calculating the uh, price elasticity of demand. Let's look at income elasticity of demand. As you might nearly guess, this is uh, uh, how the demand, the quantity of demand that changes in response to a change in income. And again, it's done proportionally. If your income increases 10%, what's going to happen to you know, the demand for certain goods? Uh, and here we have, uh, it represents, it's actually represented here by a shift in the demand curve. We're not changing the price of the goods here, uh, but we are uh, shifting uh, the demand curve. So here we have, in this curve here, relatively low income. And we're saying, what happens if we move to relatively high income? Okay. What this can mean, we can look at it two ways, uh, essentially. Uh, we could say... Uh, for a given price, when you had low income, kind of that was what you what you demanded. Uh, and now, when you have high income, lots of money to spare, uh, then uh, you would be uh, demanding that amount. Okay. So, for the same price, because you're richer, you will demand more. Alternatively, what you can uh, be saying. Uh, at the relatively low income, uh, if I'm going to be buying, let's say, a thousand units, then I will only buy a thousand units at a particular price. Uh, but at a higher income, uh, I can be kind of going along here, and I will still buy a thousand units, but I'll buy them at a much higher price. So you can look at changing uh, the, the quantity you buy at the same price or uh, uh, changing uh, the, uh, the price to buy the same uh, quantity within that. Now, you might expect that this is always going to be positive. Uh, surely, as you increase people's income, the demand will essentially go up. You're going to have a, a moving outwards here of the demand curve. But that's not always the case. You can have something which is called inferior goods. So let's say 
the inferior goods we have uh, is cheap bread, cheap, flavorless, not very pleasant bread. When people's income is very low, that's the bread they buy because they don't have a big budget for food uh, and they need to fill themselves up, they need the carbohydrates and so on. Uh, uh, but as the, as the income goes up, they have a bit of spare cash and instead of buying the cheap bread, they buy better bread. Uh, so uh, they are giving up the inferior goods, the cheap, nasty bread, uh, and they're moving to superior goods as their income increases. So uh, for inferior goods, you'll be seeing a negative income elasticity of demand. If uh, the income elasticity of demand is between zero and one, uh, it means that uh, an increase in income isn't making a huge increase in the demand for the goods. It's not negative, it's not negative, but it's not a huge increase there. Essentially, this means we're dealing with necessities. When we had low income, we had to buy these goods. And just because we have a high income doesn't mean we need any more particularly. You know, we, we, we have kind of satisfied our need uh, for these goods already, even in a low income status. If the income uh, in SSU land is greater than one, we're really dealing with luxuries. So let, let's take holidays. Uh, so when we had relatively low income, maybe we bought one holiday uh, a year. Uh, uh, but uh, when our income goes up, this is the, the sort of goods or services we might buy more of. We have more spare cash to, in a way, throw at or spend at uh, these luxuries. Uh, so we haven't, if you like, consumed as many of these things as we'd quite like or need. And when more spare cash comes along, uh, the demand really is stimulated.